The following program is the work of the broadcast students at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT Magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland which were produced over the last week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. Coming up on BCIT Magazine, Surrey RCMP charges a man in the Bab Kiran Desi murder case. And PFAL and Surrey are getting a mixed reactions. And a local robotics club will see off their grads with one final challenge. Welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Taya Fass. And I'm Cole Sorensen. A 21-year-old man has been charged with second-degree murder for the killing of Bab Kiran Desi. My co-anchor Taya Fass has the details. Bab Kiran Desi, who went by Kiran to family and friends, was only 19 when she was brutally murdered. Jesse was found dead in a burned out SUV back here in 2017. The charges were confirmed on Monday during a press conference in Surrey. 21 year old Farjot Dio has been uh, arrested and charged with the second degree murder of that parent. Police say the Dio was a person of interest early on in the investigation. They released surveillance video of two cars leaving the 18700 block on 24th Avenue in Surrey, where Desi's body was found in August. Police did not say, however, who was driving, nor did they confirm a motive. Dio was arrested in Vancouver on May 10th. Her loss will continue to be felt by her family and friends, as well as our community. I hope that there could be some small comfort in knowing the suspect has now been charged with her murder. Desi had overcome major health struggles and had just recovered from a kidney transplant. She was studying criminology at Kwantlen Polytechnic University before her sudden death. It is confirmed that Dio was Desi's boyfriend and he was known to police, but no other details surrounding the investigation have been released. Dio was expected in court on May 27th. I'm Taya Fast in Surrey for BCIT Magazine. This summer, Surrey will be updating cameras at 35 intersections to catch speeding drivers. Reporter Mohawk Sood has more. 35 intersection cameras across the province and 7 in Surrey, including this one at 152nd Street and 64th Avenue, will be updated to automatically ticket speeding vehicles. This is also the intersection where, 8 years ago, Marquita Collius' daughter, Cassandra, was killed in a car crash. This is my daughter, Cassandra. She was killed by a drunk driver on May 3rd, 2011, six weeks before her 23rd birthday. A speeding van came down the curb lane, accelerated over the railroad tracks the last 500 feet of the intersection, and slammed into Cassandra's driver's side door, striking her at 103 kilometers an hour. Collier supports the decision to add the new cameras. I'm in favor of this. There was actually a camera there from before, but it wasn't working that night. Um, sadly, I wish it had been working. Behind me is the intersection where they will be adding green light cameras. And while Marquita and others feel this is beneficial, not everyone feels that way. These excessive speed crashes that, that we see, the high profile ones in papers, and there's absolutely zero that photo radar will do about that. Despite that view, the city of Surrey feels adding technology will make a difference. Well, I think it's really helpful that we use all the tools in our toolbox. The city says by reducing your speeds from 55 kilometers per hour to 30 kilometers per hour, a pedestrian's chance of survival in a collision increases by 80 percent. The province has put in seven cameras here in Surrey. Five of those are in our very hotspot locations, and the remaining two are in between hotspot locations, so they're in high collision corridors. For Marquita Collius, there is only one goal in mind. I think that let's try it and see how it works. Um, if it reduces any type of numbers of collisions or fatalities, then it's worth it. The cameras will be updated by this summer. Mohawk Sood, in Surrey for BCIT Magazine.
A Surrey neighborhood remains divided over exotic birds, with locals still ruffling their feathers. Reporter Lori Trichler says many residents will be upset whether the birds stay or go. Behold His Majesty the Peacock. His kind have roosted in Sullivan Heights for decades. I like having them around. I like looking at them like, you know, who knows how long they're going to be around for, right? But times have changed. The hobby farms that once supported their numbers, the zoological term for which is a party, are on their way out. Clearly, Surrey isn't celebrating feral peafowl, but are they really a nuisance? I think maybe one or two people might have had a problem with them in the past, uh, but that's no reason to set up a bylaw or to trap them and get rid of them. They've been here for 55 years. The majority, and I mean like 80 to 90 percent of the people, love them. I think it's really split, like probably 50-50 down the, down the middle. Some would like to say it's lopsided on either way, but um, they've been here for so long, it's, I mean, it's really their neighborhood. The city has hauled more than a dozen peafowl to the nearby Animal Resource Center since last November. They can become quite aggressive. Often what we would hear is complaints of male uh, peacocks uh, attacking vehicles where there was a shiny reflection, um, sliding doors, patio doors. So for residents, they sometimes felt unsafe to go out into their own backyard. Surrey plans to rehome all city peafowl, but Morosevich admits it's hard enough just to catch the birds. She says finding people willing and able to adopt them will be harder still. Meanwhile, this nesting peahen is set on bringing more chicks into Sullivan Heights. I'm Laurie Trichler in Surrey for BCIT Magazine. Our reporter Laurie Trichler joins us now with more. Laurie, has the city caught any peafowl recently? They have. A young peacock was brought into the Animal Resource Center shortly before we arrived. Officials say he was caught scratching at his reflection in a coffee shop window in Surrey. Cole? And Lori, how is the city planning to catch the rest of the peafowl? Mostly through baited traps. The problem is the birds are reproducing faster than they can be caught, so I expect they'll be in Sullivan Heights for a while. Back to you, Cole. Thanks, Lori. Coming up after the break. Some cost PCIT thousands of dollars. And TransLink introduces a new program to explore local cuisine. The most rewarding thing for me has been the relationships I developed in the program, both with instructors and classmates. My sense of confidence has never, never been higher. I mean, this, this program has offered great opportunities to be in real world, real industry situations, and, and being in those moments and knowing I can contribute, I can do this. It's exciting to be in this industry and to meet lots of great people and to make amazing friends. BCIT broadcasts and online journalism, realizing your potential. A defining moment for me was when I finished my first internship and got lots of really great feedback from industry professionals. I would have never imagined I'd be walking into the floors of TSN and thinking, I'm not a student anymore, I'm here to work. I will be starting a job with an investigative news program in Toronto and I'm really excited to see that grow into what will become hopefully my dream job. BCIT broadcast and online journalism, putting you to work. Welcome back. BCIT broadcast students are still waiting for answers about who caused extensive damage in one of the computer labs. Reporter Kaya Proctor set out to investigate. BCIT's broadcast center is unique. Its open door policy allows students near constant access to expensive radio and television equipment, making the space a second home for many busy students. We all pay to go and use everything in the building. Thanks for ruining the fun. Last month, one or more people took advantage of the building's accessibility, using a steel pipe to damage thousands of dollars worth of Mac computers. So this is room 234, where approximately $50,000 worth of equipment was destroyed on April 13th. As you can see within here, 
The attack occurred right during exam season when students needed this Mac lab most. Over 21 Macs were completely destroyed with using a steel pipe. And this LCD screen, as you can see, still has not been replaced. Students were rocked when they heard about the vandalism, some finding out from teachers or photos shared to social media. Seeing the damage, it was really shocking. It was really sad too because, you know, there's so much money for those uh, computers and now it's not flushed out in the toilet, but you know, we can't get that back. Associate Dean of the Broadcast and Media Program said seeing the vandalism hit him hard. I did see the amount of damage and I was quite taken back by the senselessness of it. A little feeling, a little angry, a little violated. However, he does not want the Broadcast Center's integral community values to change. For many years we've built a, um, a really good collaborative culture between the faculty and the students and everyone takes ownership of the building and, and it's like a home. The building security will be mildly increased as a result of the vandalism with new surveillance cameras put in place and increased security patrols to help prevent any future incidents. The place feels like kind of like our second home and it's just like somebody had come in and just it rid it your home pretty much. The investigation into who committed the vandalism is still ongoing. Kaya Proctor for BCIT Magazine. With another hot and dry summer expected, parents are being warned not to leave their children in vehicles. As my co-anchor Cole Sorensen reports, these incidents can be prevented. For Vancouver dad Nathan Shrum, the death of a 16-month-old boy who was left in a car for nine hours hits close to home. You have a child with you and it's part of your life and it's, it's there with you every day and then to have it leave, I, I, I can't imagine. Last week saw record temperatures throughout the lower mainland. With the weather set to cool off this week, the inside of a car can still get dangerously hot. Inside the car, temperatures can rise 20 degrees in 20 minutes. And with children's body temperatures rising three to five times faster than adults, this could be a deadly combination. Last year in the U.S., 52 children died in hot cars, a number that experts say can decrease if parents follow some simple steps. In a statement from Burnaby RCMP, police say that parents should always be double-checking the back seat before getting out of their car. Even with the strain of everyday life, Nathan believes that it is up to parents to be responsible for their children. Upon hearing it, I was thinking back on times when you want to just run in and do something quick because you know it's going to be a little bit complicated to be packing a child with you, but it's just, you just have to do it. You have to just make adjustments and you have to find a way. So as it turns out, saving a life can be as easy as taking a look over your shoulder. I'm Cole Sorensen in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. TransLink has launched a new program to get more people to try out local cuisine. Ben Rigetti has the story. TransLink have partnered up with West Coast Food Group to promote Metro Vancouver's dining and brew pub neighbourhoods. The program features restaurant tours to encourage people to take transit. Well, TransLink believe that the program will allow Vancouverites to try more local cuisine. The owner of a Turkish restaurant in Burnaby hopes that Dine the Line can open the gates for people trying new foods. They don't want to uh, try something new that easily. Something has to push them a little bit. And uh, I think that is going to give a great push. TransLink says the program is spread across all three SkyTrain routes. We've come up with three maps which correspond with the SkyTrain lines, the Expo line, Millennium line and Canada line. They have their own individual themes. And we're encouraging people to go along those lines and try out some of the culinary experiences which are available. The theme for the Expo line is World Cuisine. Some TransLink users can't wait to try the convenient new program. I do like trying new restaurants, um, but I find that it's hard to look for it. I really have to go out and search for it online. While the program is just starting up, restaurant owners see it as a perfect chance to introduce foreign foods. I wanted this place to be a gate to the food of Turkey. That's why the name is Anatolia's Gate, opening to Vancouver. I wanted to introduce Turkish food to the community over here at large. The campaign launched last week and will be in place throughout the summer. Ben Rigetti, in Burnaby, for BCIT Magazine.
are joined by reporter Ben Rigetti. Can you tell us about future plans for Dine the Line? Well, Taya Transing is launching a new social media contest to try and encourage people to use the program with hashtag Dine the Line. Transing is also looking for more restaurants to come and join the 30 existing restaurants in the program. Taya? And how have people reacted so far? Well, I've talked to both transit users as well as restaurant owners and both seem pretty happy with the concept, but they're hoping it will grow more over time. Back to you. Thanks, Ben. Vancouver City Council is considering increasing the number of dog waste bins at parks around the city. Reporter Griff McDonald went out to see what dog owners think about the plan. Here at John Hendry Park in East Vancouver, a bit of rain isn't enough to keep locals away from walking their dogs. And at this park, they have the option to dispose of their doggy doo-doo in a sustainable way. Well, it really stands out, so that I think it's great that it's red. Dog waste bins are great, and the only bad thing about it is the hand sorting. The red bins were introduced in 2016 as part of a pilot program. This week, Vancouver City Council is looking into placing more of the bins in Vancouver parks. While you will currently only find six parks in Vancouver with these bins, the hope is to expand that number with the intention of diverting all dog waste away from landfills. An increase in the number of bins will mean an increase in work for Scooby's Dog Waste Removal Service. Absolutely. It would be good for the city, it would be good for my business, it would be good for the environment. The company has been around since 1992. It is the only dog waste removal business that works directly with the city to empty the red bins. Ensuring the proper disposal of dog waste will help to promote cleaner streets and parks. And you know that's the big thing is that all the municipalities right now are geared towards getting organics out of the landfill and it qualifies as organic. If you're looking to throw out your doggy doo-doo at a local park anytime soon, make sure to keep an eye out for a red bin. Griff McDonald in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. After the break, and the finale is coming. Fans express their feelings about the end of a TV series. Going live in three, two, one. CIT television and video production. You've got potential. Hi, I'm Nikita Nayak. And I'm Isaiah Condon. Here's your community calendar. Step into the past as you relive the Roaring Twenties at the Burnaby Village Museum for Victoria Day. Watch the parade that spit for royals and dive deep into British history. Watch the Union Jack flag fly high and enjoy a slice of birthday cake. Head down to Surrey's Buzz Community Bee Garden and learn about the honeybees that contribute to the natural habitat of Surrey. And don't forget to try out the fresh honey straight from the hive. If you're looking to stay indoors, the North Vancouver Spring Film Festival is just for you. Catch a screening of the award-winning film Free Solo and sit on the edge of your seat as you could watch what could be the greatest feature in rock climbing history. That was your community calendar for next week. Say goodbye to spring and hello to summer. Welcome back. A local conservationist has been working hard to bring life to BCIT's Gishon Creek by releasing salmon fry for spawning. Grayson Rudsky has the story. Salmon fry were released into BCIT's Gishon Creek for the eighth year in a row. The creek is now a healthy waterway, but that wasn't always the case. Not until Mark Angelo took notice. We started this decades-long effort to try and restore this creek. Uh, and over the years it came back to life and that has been so exciting and so rewarding and just simply wonderful to see. Angelo has spent his whole life defending rivers around the world. In Gishon Creek alone he's released thousands of chum salmon and trout. 
He's also the founder of the BCIT Rivers Institute, an organization which has aspirations of restoring sections of the creek up beyond BCIT campus. Slowly but surely, we had to plan to try and bring it back to what it once was. And actually, during BCIT orientation, when in the very first years of the school, we actually used to uh, have a, a streamside planting event that new students could participate in. Keyshawn Creek's transformation over the years brings some nature to campus, but it also serves as a teachable moment here at BCIT's Child Care Center. The salmon run is something the kids look forward to year after year. We try to to do teachable moments in here in the daycare and using his example too, because I think this age is a very important age. Now that the creek's healthy, what keeps Angelo coming back to campus is the hope that he can leave an impression on the next generation. Grayson Redsky in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Heritage Woods Secondary School offers the only robotics club in the Tri-Cities. Today, the club will be competing in one final challenge before saying goodbye to its graduating members. Mercedes Lay has more. These robots and their trainers are having a little bit of fun before Robot in Three Days Challenge. This weekend, the team will have 72 hours to build, design, and test a robot like this one. Something that um, we've never done before as a club. It's a new experience for us and it will hopefully promote our club in a new way. The club decided to do this challenge as a final goodbye to its original members. Four years ago, a group of students proposed the idea for the club. From that handful of students, the club has now grown to more than 30 members. Not everybody is going to go into engineering through because they are part of the robotics team, but I'm hoping that experience allowed them to become a better team player, uh, to, to develop their leadership skills, and also understand the process of design and planning. Milne will be going to SFU for what it calls its mechatronics program in the fall. He hopes to one day make robotic prosthetics. For now though, he's excited to see how his classmates continue his legacy. Like some of the grade nine robots that we've seen this year, they are miles ahead of what I would have built in grade nine. And what happens to the robot after the three days? Well, it will be used next season to further recruit more members. I am Mercedes Lay in Port Moody for BCIT Magazine. For eight seasons, Game of Thrones has captured audiences around the globe. The series finale airs Sunday, and as reporter Matt Pereira found out, fans are excited to see who finally will take a seat on the Iron Throne. Grab an ale, light a candle, and prepare for the end. The finale is coming. As Sunday approaches, venues around Vancouver, including Storm Crow, are getting ready to air the last episode. It, it's definitely different seeing it with a whole group of people than sitting at home. Um, as much as I'm kind of a fan of watching it uh, on my own, only because I appreciate uh, pure silence around me. This is my first year here. Um, seeing it with everybody in the room is, uh, the emotions hit you a little harder, I think. The bar has become a popular hangout amongst diehards, where drinks are drunk and everyone's favorite teenage assassin is openly celebrated. Who's your favorite character? Arya Stark. Arya Stark. I have a bunch. Jon Snow was just big because of I think his story was so enticing. Um, I really enjoyed Arya's as well. I look forward to seeing this one. And one of the show's most popular creatures is created right here in Vancouver. A team of over 100 people at local special effects company Image Engine are responsible for the fire-breathing dragon, Drogon. Whether you decide to watch the last episode at home or venture out to one of Vancouver's public screenings, there's no doubt that this will be one of the biggest television events this year. It's nice to interact with other fans, talk theories with people that are outside your friend group. The show has been a global phenomenon and will definitely be a bittersweet ending for devoted fans. I can't believe it's going to be done. It's kind of crazy, right? Matt Pereira in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. The Vancouver Giants are celebrating a successful season. Meanwhile, Langley businesses and politicians are excited too. Our reporter Nikhil Velji finds out why. The Vancouver Giants capped off a thrilling season on the cusp of a WHL championship mostly played here at the Langley Event Center. Uh, having been a, kind of a Giants fan because I went to high school with a player, just like getting to know the rest of the team because of that. Is Cam is fresh off the plane from Game 7. 
He explains how the Giants have impacted him. It's really changed my life and how I see things. It's definitely developed uh, my confidence. Cam is among many Giants fans who make the long commute to the Langley Event Center to watch the team play. It's going to draw people, whether it be in Langley proper or around the surrounding communities, out like as far as Abbotsford. There's people coming in there. I know a few. And people coming in, even as far as still coming in from North Vancouver. The mayor of Langley Township says with more people coming to the area for Giants games, the area is gaining an economic benefit. Just a small example of people come to the games, they go to the restaurants. Uh, the hotels fill up because you have the visiting team, you have uh, the staff from the teams, the referees all get put up, uh, plus fans come from all over. Uh, huge economic benefit uh, to the township of Langley and, and our areas. Froze adds the Giants' recent playoff run has given the community something to believe in and be proud of. Uh, it's, given, uh, it's given us a lot of pride. You know, talk about your civic pride or your town pride, knowing that the Giants are here and, and uh, watching that stadium fill up night after night. To Although the lights on the Vancouver Giants season are out, the future of hockey in Langley is as bright as it's ever been. There's some loyal Giants fans who still make it the trek out to Langley, despite however far it is. Nikhil Velji in Langley for BCIT Magazine. Last night, the Boston Bruins swept the Carolina Hurricanes to advance to the Stanley Cup Finals. And in the West, the St. Louis Blues and the San Jose Sharks face off at 5 tonight for Game 4 of the Western Conference Finals. Blues fans, however, are still upset after the referees missed the hand pass that led to the game-winning goal. If you have any questions regarding the show, you can contact us at bcit-broadcast.com or bcitnews.com. I'm Cole Sorensen. Thank you for tuning in to our final show of the year. That was your BCIT Magazine for this week. I'm Taya Fast, and on behalf of all of us here, have a great summer. And make sure to tune in when we come back in September of 2019.